Nowhere to Call Home by Cynthia Day Police, Chapter 10. When Frankie and Stewpot arrived back at the jungle, Vera was tending the fire, feeding it just enough from the pile of wood Tex had gathered to keep it going. About time you gaffer showed up, she called. We was about to eat Tex's boots, only there's not enough leather left on them things to mention. Tex looked down at his boots and grimaced. Frankie looked too. She thought they had to be the sorriest excuse for a pair of shoes she had ever seen. Broken laces held together by a few strips of leather that were barely connected to thin, worn-down soles. Gotta get something to cover my dogs before the snow starts flying, Tex mumbled. When you do, Dot called from where she was arranging a straw bag under one of the sheds. Grease them up good. That makes them last. Let's have a look at what you stiffs got, said Vera, pointing at the bundle Frankie and Stewpot carried. Frankie untied the sack from the stick, and Stewpot proudly held it open. Tex, Blink, Vera, Dot, and Happy Joe gathered around. Tex whistled with admiration. Dot, you and me better get chopping, said Vera. Too bad we don't have a little meat, Dot said wistfully. Meat, said Blink with a snort. What's that? Meat's always yesterday or tomorrow, Vera said. Never today. She took a knife from her pocket and began cutting up a cabbage. You, she said, directing the knife tip toward Frankie. Wash them spuds off, would you? As Frankie walked to the river bank with the potatoes, she saw three more hobos approaching the jungle. Back at the campfire, the newcomers, all boys, were offering contribution to the meal. One who introduced himself as Slim Jim had three fish. Another, named Spit, handed over a bag of day-old donuts. The last, a big strapping boy with red hair, who was called Omaha Red by the others, reached underneath his coat and produced a chicken. There were cheers and whistles at the sight of it. Looks like Red had him some luck, said Happy Joe. How'd you pull that off in broad daylight? Blink asked. Vera was eyeing the chicken warily. The farmer you nabbed that from. Is he gonna be bringing the coppers down on us? Nah, scoffed Omaha Red. What do you take me for, a punk? Red's remark reminded Frankie of her own lowly status as a punk, and she kept her mouth shut. Besides, it was apparent from the talk that Red had stolen the chicken, and that made Frankie feel peculiar. She hated to think that policemen might come and arrest them, but that wasn't all that bothered her. She and Stupot had worked hard for the food they had brought back to the jungle, and the farmer and his wife had paid them willingly and generously. Frankie had felt quite proud of that. It was exactly the way Junius had described hoboing. Stealing, that was another matter. She watched to see how Stewpot reacted to the stolen chicken. He seemed as happy as everyone else about having a little meat in the pot. Vera made short work of skinning and cutting up the chicken, and soon the pot was bubbling and the smell of the concoction called mulligan had drawn them all into a circle around the fire. Everyone was waiting for Vera to declare the stew ready. The three fish had already been skewered on sticks, cooked and eaten, along with the doughnuts and most of the apples. But the tantalizing aroma of the stew kept them riveted to their places. While they were waiting, another tramp joined them, an older man named Peg Leg Al. He and Tex knew each other and were doing a little catching up. Ain't seen you since that time in Cincy, said Tex. You lost some tea cents then, I see, said Al. Yeah, Tex answered with a sigh. Got in a bust up with a bull on the Santa Fe. He tried to kick me off, and I kicked back. I guess you could say I won the argument, but I lost the darn teeth while I was at it. Al nodded sympathetically. You got rid of your crutch and got yourself a leg, observed Tex. Yep, said Al proudly, holding up his wooden leg for all to admire. Made it myself. Frankie looked at the homemade contraption. Two narrow boards were nailed together at the bottom and held open by a cross piece at the top. A wad of cloth rested on the cross piece, and on that rested Al's stump. Pieces of canvas and leather held the leg to Al's thigh, and an extra wide strap ran over his right shoulder to hold the whole thing in place. Watch how I can hustle on this baby, said Al. He stood up and walked quickly into the deepening shadows away from the fire. Ain't you afraid of slipping? called Blink. Nah, answered Al, returning to the circle and sitting back down. I've got a chunk of Kelly Springfield tire on the bottom. When I decide to lamb, I leave skid marks. He guffawed, and everyone, Frankie included, laughed along. Soup's on, Vera announced. Pass your plates and don't be pushy about it. There's a few spoons that was left here. Not enough to go around, though. Smooth and quick as a cat, Stewpot reached out a hand, grabbed two spoons, and handed one to Frankie. She held her tin of stew on her lap and took a first cautious taste. Her eyes widened with pleasure. Who could have imagined that cabbage and potatoes and the odd piece of chicken could taste so incredibly good? She was quite certain that she had never eaten anything as wonderful as this stuff called mulligan. The stew and the fire combined to create a relaxed, contented mood around the circle. Vera gave one final order. This place was crummy when we got here. 
but we ain't leaving it that way for the next gang. So clean your tins after all, ya. Then she settled down to her own plate. While they ate, they talked, and Frankie listened. A favorite topic was the bulls. Both the railroad police and regular uniform cops, and tips for outwitting them. The conversation returned often to food, how to get it, and how to make it taste better. What I do, said Blank, is I walk back and forth in front of a restaurant or coffee shop, checking out the guys sitting at the counter. Then I go in and sit down next to one, and I give my spiel to the waitress, you know? Can I wash dishes for a plate and a cup of coffee? Nine times out of ten, one of the guys at the counter will say, give the kid a plate and pay for it himself. Tex nodded approvingly, but Dot said, I try that and nine times out of ten, the guy will want something for his kindness, if you know what I mean. Frankie didn't know exactly, but Vera grinned slyly, eat and run, fast. They talked about the hard times that had come to the country. Slim Jim told about actually finding work. I unloaded coal all day and the guy hands me two tomatoes. I give him back and says, if that's all you're giving for a day's work, you must need it more than I do. Others had similar stories. Then talk changed to the subject of the upcoming winter, which everyone spoke of with dread. But to Frankie, sitting on her straw sack next to Stew Pot, winter and its troubles seemed far away. She looked up at the sky and thought she'd never notice how black it was, how bright the stars were, or how close they seemed. The chill of the night air against her back made the fire's warmth on her face feel even more comforting. Her belly was full and her body felt deliciously tired from the hard work of digging potatoes. She smiled drowsily to herself. Junius should have seen her today. Nobody could call her shiftless. Hey, Frankie Blue, a voice spoke loudly in her ear. She started out of her half-sleep to find Stewpot gazing at her with a grin. Wake up and play us something on that mouth organ, would you? Sure, Frankie said. She reached into her traveling bag, took out the harmonica, and looked around at the circle of faces. I'm not that good, she said apologetically, thinking of the way Junius could play. Just play her, said Happy Joe. It beats listen to Vera flap in her mouth. Vera turned to give Happy Joe a playful swat while Frankie played a few practice notes to warm up. She began with Amazing Grace, since Stewpot had seemed to enjoy it so much the night before. After a few bars, she was pleased to hear someone humming along. Then Dot joined in, singing in a voice that was surprisingly sweet and clear. Oh my, Dot said when the music ended. I do like that song, but tonight it makes me feel too sad. Could you play something, you know, a little more lively? Frankie played Camp Town Races, followed by every lively song she could recall. Some of the others joined Dot in singing from time to time, and Slim Jim and Omaha Red kept time by drumming on their dinner tins. While Slim Jim, Stewpot, Vera, and Omaha Red had a smoke, Frankie played Swanee River, sweet and slow and quiet. When she looked up, the flames from the fire had died to a few glowing embers. Vera and Blink were stretched out on the ground on the other side of the fire, peering into the darkness. She saw lumps that she realized were the others rolled up in blankets. The rest, she figured, had gone to find shelter in the lean-tos. Want to flop here next to the fire? asked Stewpot. Frankie nodded, putting the harmonica in her pocket. She arranged one of the straw-filled sacks on the ground and lay down. The burlap was scratchy against her cheek, and a musty smell arose from inside. She reached into her bag and took out two articles of clothing in the dim light. She couldn't tell what they were, but it didn't matter. She handed one to Stewpot. What's this? he asked. Put it under your head if you like, Frankie told him. It's softer than the sack. Hmm, said Stewpot. Smells better, too. la dee da Frankie curled up on her side and snuggled down into the straw mattress. The sadness and desperation of the past few days seemed far away, as if they had happened in a different world. She could feel the warmth from Stewpot's body on her right side, the heat from the fire on her left. She couldn't remember feeling happier.